Well, hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, AI Unleashed, Tackle Data Management Hurdles for Success. I'm Wade Rausch. I'm a business and technology journalist and audio producer based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Okay, now I'd like to walk you through our topic for today and then introduce you to our panelists. So, as the title of the webinar says, we're gonna be talking today about next-gen AI and the workloads that it creates, and specifically how to manage the, the boatloads of data that are required to train today's state-of-the-art AI models and make them useful for your business. So to handle those newer AI workloads, such as transformers and uh, other deep learning frameworks require, you need thousands of GPUs acting on literally billions of data parameters. We know GPT-2 from OpenAI was trained on 1.5 billion parameters. GPT-3 was trained on 175 billion parameters. And we don't know how many parameters it took to train GPT-4 because OpenAI hasn't said, but there are rumors circulating that it's in the hundreds of trillions. For these very large models, both in the training phase and the inference phase, where you ask the model questions, you're sifting through so many small pieces of data that the input output load would crush a traditional storage system. So all that computation also obviously has a huge cost in terms of the electricity needed to power all of those GPUs, which means that if you wanna use the newest AI models in your business and you wanna keep your hardware and energy costs down, you probably need to find new kinds of architectures to handle these crazy loads. And that's what our two guests are going to talk about today. So now I want to bring them on and introduce them. First, I want, to, I want you to meet Shimon Ben David. Shimon is the Chief Technology Officer at Weka, which provides a data management platform for organizations in the life sciences, media, entertainment, financial services, federal government, and other sectors. In his role as CTO, Shimon engages with customers, analysts, and partners to track emerging trends and technologies and to bring actionable feedback to the company's engineering and product management teams. He also runs the CTO Office Solutions Group and directs the company's longer-term vision. In his nearly eight years at Weka, he has held leadership roles in both support and sales engineering, and previously he ran support services for primary data, Extreme IO, and IBM. Shimon is also an active member of the ML Commons Storage Working Group and actively mentors young entrepreneurs. Also joining us today is Ellen Klingerman. He's the Chief Technology Strategist for Power Edge High Performance Architecture at Dell Technologies. Ellen has more than 30 years of award-winning experience in enterprise architecture, design and consulting, high performance computing, analytics, AI, and IT professional sales and technical leadership. His work experience ranges from mainframe computers at IBM to large application landscapes, analytics, and AI on engineered stems at Dell, Oracle, and Citrix. His focus areas include generative and traditional AI, high-performance computing, analytics, data lakes, SAP, Oracle, SQL, hybrid cloud containers, virtual desktop infrastructure, and, and a lot more. So Shimon and Alan, it's really great to have you both here. Thank you for joining us. I know you've prepared a set of introductory slides to get us going. So do you want to dive into those? De definitely. Thank you, Wade. So I think we initially wanted to talk up, to introduce the, the topic. So uh, we call it the era of AI um, because what we're seeing is that um, AI and especially generative AI in the last year is exploding all over uh, multiple organizations, multiple businesses that would like to actually uh, modernize their environments uh, and to get to massive business outcomes. So some examples that we're seeing with, uh, with generative AI use cases that customers are already uh, benefiting from. So for example, rendering video games in real time, rendering movies in real time, creating digital twin environments, uh, di 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 sorry, digital assets that can then be utilized, um, environments that automatically query hardware 
and makes prediction regarding uh, manufacturing line failures. So, so the value is immense and it is, uh, and it's already being capitalized to, to save millions and billions of dollars, but also to create a massive value and massive revenue. Uh, and what we're seeing today is that uh, every organization uh, is dipping their leg and uh, starting some sort of AI initiative. Ellen, do you, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me pull on that thread a little bit because uh, there's a recent survey we just had that was pretty interesting that came out. Uh, and it was across uh, you know global 2,500 accounts. And it showed that 92% of them acknowledge that they're going to have an AI first strategy in the next 12 months. And I would say this definitely resonated. I, I think generative AI has got everybody thinking what this can do for the business, right? And I think the important context of this, like open AI and all those incredible technologies that got people to think, if I'm going to do anything with it and, and actually provide business value, right, to increase profit, reduce expense, et cetera, uh, I really need to have it powered by the company's data. That's the difference, right? Versus a open model that we all use for productivity purposes. Now we want to take that same technology and apply it to your data. In many cases, right, this is tied to applications, right, uh, in traditional business operations, as well as unstructured data. And how do we, you know, kind of rise up all that dark data that's out there to get value out of it? Brilliant, exactly. And I think what we're seeing is that customers uh, are, are seeing the, or hearing about the benefit of, of AI and generative AI. And every CIO, CTO has a mandate to, to as, as you mentioned, to be an AI first. And what does that mean? How do they create an AI strategy? How do they derive value? Uh, we're seeing different AI projects that are being handled differently. Some leads to success and some are uh, in the nascent stage. Uh, we actually did a survey, um, uh, Alan, I think you mentioned part of it, but we, we did a survey um, acro across uh, more than a thousand uh, enterprise organizations to, to look at their challenges, to, to see what they experience with their journey in terms of uh, um, what are the hurdles, what are the motivations, and we're actually going to share Speaky results here as well. Uh, the, the complete survey actually is available also, obviously, on, on the website. Uh, before that, I think we wanted to go to our first poll question uh, to learn from you uh, about your environment. Um, if we can pop up to the poll question, which of the following best describes your, your AI needs? So, um, as, as mentioned, different organization obviously have different needs. Um, so what would describe your, your AI needs environment? So to, uh, maybe I'll just go over the, the, the potential answers, building uh, models and deploying them for production use. That's definitely one value, fine tuning other models uh, for your use cases, deploying uh, existing models without changing them. So, um, so there's the, the, the notion of maybe I, I'm building my own LLMs, my own models, uh, maybe I'm fine-tuning others. Maybe I'm just downloading uh, existing models without doing anything uh, and using them. What am I using them for? Maybe I'm using them for uh, co-pilot environments, writing code, augmenting my environment. Obviously, there's the answer of uh, we currently aren't using AI, so that's also valid. Yeah, it looks like the biggest group is people who aren't currently using AI. But right after that, you've got um, answer one, people building models and deploying them for production. As these answers uh, kind of stream in, um, the, the smallest category is deploying existing models with no change for production. <laughs> so, so so maybe we'll talk about that for a second. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, there's, there's the notion where we, we see different organizations plugging in two AI use cases in different in different ways, obviously. Some, I can write my application just API into an existing uh, LLM provider and, and just funnel my queries to that. So I don't even deploy an AI environment. I mostly even just utilize. The, the value is immense. I don't need to, to train a model to, to compute on it. I just, it, it's AI as a service, as an API. Uh, the, the downside is that now I'm getting a generic value, something that's not customized to my environment, to my custom, to my customers, to my data. Uh, a, a fun environment that uh, I'm using is if I'm selling vegetables, maybe I'm 
uh, my website just points to a generic model that knows fruits and vegetables. But maybe if I want to provide even a better services, I would like to fine tune that model to say this is not just an apple. This is a Grandsmith, a Honeycrisp, uh, and to be more fine tuned to my existing data. And so there's these uh, this different use cases and advantages. Uh, different ways would be also to include uh, RAG, retrieval augmentation, to actually even pinpoint to my specific data. That was what came to mind for me with number three. <laughs> it's super popular now, right? Of like an easy way to get started in AI and start thinking about like, what do I do with with the, you know some documents that already have existing in a knowledge base uh, to get some value, right? And a couple of, of different methodologies there. I, I thought it was interesting. Like if you, if you add this up, it doesn't, it, it makes complete sense, right? Of like, it's uh, the rule of thirds. You have, you know, uh, some very advanced people that are out there doing, uh, you know, some uh, great work. Some that are starting to, it looks like to to do some work in AI and at various stages, and then some that haven't started the journey yet. So uh, it doesn't surprise me. That's right in line with kind of what I've been finding, you know, talking with customers globally. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and that makes sense, right? Uh, not, not all AI have been created uh, um, uh, the same. So with that, I'll actually move to the discussion that, so we mentioned this uh, survey that we did and, and the results that we, we got out of it uh, were actually very interesting. So if we're looking at the challenges, the technical inhibitors uh, that organization mentioned for their AI success, first of all, uh, starting from the bottom, compute performance. So so I would say that even the, the, the advanced organization uh, recognized the fact that they needed to feed their GPUs, feed their compute, in a much more efficient way to make sure that uh, if I have uh, one or, or 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 GPU servers or GPUs in my environment, how do I make sure that I actually uh, optimize for their use cases and they're all 90% um, utilization? Otherwise, my investment is not being fully utilized. So that's one challenge. And I would categorize it, again, for the advanced environments that are usually uh, training these large models and really uh, have uh, the engineering talent to to try and, 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 and squeeze that uh, compute performance. Um, the next challenge is security. So um, as I think Ellen and Wade, you mentioned, when in order to, to dip your leg in this uh, environment, you, you really need massive amounts of data. So there's this notion of data as the new source code. So how do you uh, make sure that your data is secure? Uh, a lot of the data is personal, a lot of the data is copyrighted. Obviously, there, the, there is still a lot of discussion around uh, who has the rights to use which data and do you need to acknowledge it. But there, there are some hard guidelines like GDPR and where is the data coming from, where can it go, where it can be used. Um, so, so I would say that's another, or what we're seeing is that uh, that's another major challenge. And, and by far the largest challenge is data management. How do I, uh, where do I accumulate the data? How do I do it in an efficient, cost-effective way? How do I move the data between different environments so that I can feed my, my AI pipelines uh, in an efficient way? Who can access it? How much will it cost? Is it on-prem? Is it cloud? Is it across data centers? So the data management aspect and the, the, the challenge here is, and I think we, we talked about it a few times on other environments is, um, it's almost like with GPU environments, you, you're bringing classical HP, HPC challenges to the uh, enterprise organization. So HPC, high performance computer centers that are used to handling billions in, in, of files, billions of inodes, varying sizes, multiple uh, cores accessing the same data. Suddenly, this is the challenge of uh, the regular enterprise domains and the data management aspect of it is, is staggering. And, the, the interesting part is you cannot use the same methodologies as you did for your enterprise data to manage your uh, data at scale. Maybe I'll pull on thread in each of those three areas real quick. Uh, I think the first one, like the compute performance, I correlated back to the survey results we got. Those that haven't started might not have started because they didn't have the right compute elements. It goes back to what you said, right? Like this is traditional HPC architecture, what we now have kind of defined as high performance architecture, uh, you know, which is the workload patterns for HPC, AI and analytics at this point. Uh, and most of the time it is powered by by GPUs. 
And these are more esoteric things that many IT organizations, right, have not dealt with unless they have an HPC cluster. Um, so, you know, that is new. It's it's not your standard virtualization environment or moving into the realm of containers. So there's a lot of shifts for IT, right, as we move um, towards this paradigm. Uh, I think the next one in security, uh, you hit upon a couple of the key areas there. I think the number one thing, if you think about powered by your data and applications, if I'm going to get value out of AI, it's all about the company's IP. This is why we're seeing, if, if I talk about, I always get the question of like, Alan, you know, since you, you work for Dell Technologies, what are you seeing from an on-premise perspective? And is there repatriation happening? And uh, yes, it's, it's in this area where you have high performance requirements because the cost can balloon very rapidly as opposed to traditional applications and security because if I'm going to power it with my IP, right, I need to make sure that that IP you know, is safe and secure 99% of the time behind my own firewall because it's frankly very tightly tied many times to my business process, right? Um, and then we think of data management. Uh, everybody struggled with this, like that journey to AI. If I don't have uh, enough data, uh, you know, I'm not ready for AI, which is probably another thing why maybe others haven't started because they never, you know, went and built out a, a large uh, data lake, right, on Hadoop or other esoteric technologies like that. Now there's better ways to get that accomplished, right, with data mesh, data buses and and other technologies. So, yeah, the, this this is, uh, I think, right in line with what we're all seeing out there. Brilliant. I think one thing that we we're starting to see also more and more um, and, and it ties into the performance, to the security, to the man data management is also the sustainability aspect, which I think we'll touch about more. Uh, sustainability in AI is becoming more and more, instead of a nice fluffy word, it becomes a business objective that is quantifiable by dollar amounts. Um, and, and I think we'll touch about it more. Um, moving forward, so uh, we wanted to ask you another question. So if we can pop up that poll. What is the most challenging aspect of your AI project? So obviously, again, as we've seen, different environments are, or organizations are being challenged by with differently. So is it accumulating enough data? Uh, is it pre-processing the data? Let, let's touch a bit about that, pre-processing the data. Uh, Alan, as you mentioned, it, it, it needs massive amounts of data. You, you basically need to accumulate, to generate, to buy data. Um, Pre-processing the data is a hard challenge, and I would even say that what we're seeing is uh, in many organizations, pre-processing of the data takes up to 70 to 80% of an AI training's life cycle. Basically looking at the data, massaging it, cleaning it, cleaning it um, um, making sure that it's in the right format. So uh, there's this uh, joke uh, with data scientists that uh, if you have two data scientists, you have five different ways to pre-process the data for their models, right? Um, so so that, uh, that, that this is a very massive, uh, actually, I would say even storage intensive uh, use case. Next part is embedding the data. So are you using any vector database? Uh, embedding the data to, to, to some sort of data, vector database is interesting, but then it's very complicated on how do you run that pipeline of embedding and what are the implications of it? Uh, training and fine tuning, by, by the way, do you train an LLM? Do you fine tune an LLM? And also, do you rag on this environment? Is, is inferencing a challenge? Um, and, and it's interesting to see the difference between the difference between inferencing with um, traditional hand quotes uh, AI and generative AI. The, the inferencing is completely different in, in terms of uh, the outputs and, and how it runs. Uh, is archiving your models and data for long term a challenge? Because if now we, you created a model, let's say that you spent all of the time and effort and you're now you trained on, on massive amounts of data, how do you archive that model? How do you, there's the notion of explainable AI. How do you make sure that your uh, environment is, uh, can be explainable in the future, that you're not biased, that you, you tested on the right populations, right environments? And obviously, uh, other and other clip to, uh, applicable is interesting as well. It looks like um, by far the largest group here are stuck on the first step, just finding, you know, proprietary high quality curated data to train their models on. And I wonder whether folks who have finished that step and have good data then discover that all of these other things are actually very difficult challenges, right? Once they get over that hump. 
it's almost table stakes. If you don't have enough data, you won't reach into, you won't get into the next challenges. Once you do have, it's actually, it's uh, it really, it's really interesting that if you look at an AI pipeline, an AI pipeline is actually composed out of these steps, one to five in this order. First of all, there's the challenge of accumulating the data. And then how do you massage and pre-process it? How do you embed it uh, in some sort of fashion? Uh, but then fine tune and training it is the next step. And that's the next challenge and inferencing. It's interesting that inferencing is uh, so low. That yeah. was that was well, it, but it's funny because I, I think we all picked up on this. Is I think if everybody's struggling on those first few phases, and this is what I found right working with many customers is they struggle to ever get something to inference. Um, so they they don't have that problem because they're not there yet. So they might do that for one or two, but they don't know how to b build like a enterprise AI, you know, modular scalable approach to bring inference because it, it is the requirements from both the compute and storage layer for inference are completely different. Definitely. I, I wonder if we do this uh, poll in in a quarter or two from now. <laughs> it would exactly change. Inferencing would be um, much more uh, challenging because Higher. people uh, would have reached to that stage uh, at their AI pipeline. That's brilliant. Great. Uh, do we want to move? Um, excellent. So uh, being a bit technical here, because we did want to, pr to, to talk about that and provide that uh, insight as well, this is what we're seeing. And I know it's a bit of an eye, eye chart, but I'll explain what we're seeing it here. It's, it's, uh, th this is what we're seeing in, in an AI environment. So there's in a real production AI, so we talked about the different stages in an AI pipeline, ingesting the data, pre-processing on it, uh, training, uh, in validating, inferencing, and, and all the way down to archiving it. And again, that's at a very high level. You can always double click in each of them and it's a hundred different stages by itself. But uh, it, generally speaking, each of these stages by itself is uh, composed out of different, different uh, software, and fra software frameworks, different uh, data patterns, uh, they all access a, a lot of the same data, generating it, reading it, generating more data, but uh, each stage has its own data access and data requirements. Um, in a real AI environment, um, I would say once you're out of the day zero, day one, where you had one GPU server, maybe in your laptop, maybe in a workstation, now let's say that you have five, 10, 50, 5,000 uh, GPU servers, they all hit your storage environment uh, in, in multiple different IR patterns. So there's no, hey, I need my storage to be uh, suitable for training or my storage needs to be suitable for inferencing or pre-processing because it, it, you don't have any chance to optimize your storage to one uh, use case only because it's constantly being hit by multiple different GPUs, multiple different stages of the pipeline. And that derives a ridiculous amount of different IO patterns small, large, and, and we'll see that actually in a second, but that, that's the um, IO blender on your storage. Look, looking at it, um, what we did is we looked at um, one of our systems, we actually looked at a few, but we're going to show only one um, of, of our systems, of, of our customers in, in, in our call home environment. So this is a real customer environment that is running in production. Obviously, um, we can say who that customer is. It's it's a massive AI project. And we, what we wanted to learn from it is, let's see how does the storage experience uh, this massive different IO patterns that are being hit on it or that are being needed from it, right? So if we're looking here up top, we're seeing that uh, we, we're actually, uh, this customer has 1,019 uh, GPU servers connected to the environment. If we're looking at the right bottom side with the circle, we can see that the IO patterns that are being thrown on the storage are actually 50% uh, read, 50% writes. And this is an accumulation of the last, an averaging of the last two days. So in the last two days, these 1,019 GPU servers, uh, when working on the storage, each of them obviously being in different stages of the AI pipeline. Some are training, some are inferencing, I would say offline inferencing as well. Some are pre-processing, some are even ingesting data. So during these last two days, 50% of the IOs were reads and writes. So, so that says that, hey, your storage needs to be uh, 
able to read and write. It can't be a read-only storage or, or a burst buffer write-only environment. It has to be a shared read and write environment because some of the servers will write data, some of the servers will, will use immediately use that data and read it and, and vice versa. Hey, um, hey, Shimon, let me make one comment because you just nailed it. Like, look at the patterns of traditional storage and what happened for many enterprises, right? Building things out. This highlights the issue because <laughs> you just said it. 80-20 was the typical rule that we had for enterprise storage. There were always, uh, you know, one-offs, right, for specific in-memory databases, et cetera, data marts, et cetera. But, you know, for general use cases across the spectrum of storage in the enterprise, it was 80-20. I mean, this this really kind of highlights some of the issues you're kind of walking through. Brilliant. Y yes. Uh, but by the way, the word generative in generative of AI is actually <laughs> very indicative of, uh, yep. of, of generating data. Um, but when we're looking at the process, the things like checkpointing, hey, I'm checkpointing my model while I'm training it. So so even training, which was considered to be a very read intensive environment, is generating data and writing. Obviously, when you're inferencing and you're generating data. So so there is uh, that aspect. If we look actually um, to the right of that circle and we look at these two bars where it shows tiny IOs, these are actually reads and write sizes. So, so looking at the IO patterns, uh, on average for these two days, uh, we see that there's very tiny reads, sorry, very tiny writes. Um, when, when looking at it at our uh, cloud environment, it's, it's actually 30 kilobyte in, uh, writes, and the reads are um, around 400 kilobytes. So, so we're looking at an environment that is running 50% reads and writes. The, the writes are tiny, the reads are slightly larger. Um, if we're looking at the uh, at the four charts in the middle, we can see that uh, it's a lot of, uh, we're doing here 1.6 million small IOs uh, generating hundreds of gigabytes uh, of uh, uh, throughput by running these small IOs. So even running, so there's the need to have millions of small IOs, slightly larger IOs, reads, writes. By the way, the latency, um, you're seeing that at the bottom part of the two charts is anywhere between 90 microseconds to 500 microseconds. So, and obviously there's some peaks here, but that, that's an average. So what, what we're showing here, and again, we have multiple of these uh, uh, environments that we analyzed and, and they all converged on, on similar things. Your AI environment, which could be classical AI, but could be image recognition, NLP, NLU, could be an LLM, could be generative, other generative AI models. Um, in general, if you look across the stack and you don't just, look at one part of the pipeline, would be composed out of um, approximately 50% reads and writes, would be composed out of tiny IOs, slight, slightly larger IOs. We've seen actually IOs go all the way from uh, 30 kilobytes to two megabytes IOs, bursting for some effect. Uh, it would also, one thing that uh, we, we, we saw in multiple environments that it would also very benefit very much from low latency. Because if now I have multiple GPUs, and they're dropping to the storage, getting the data, and computing it on, on their, in their memory, if now they're getting the data in 200 microseconds or two milliseconds, that's an order of magnitude. So even though a lot of these GPUs don't necessarily need uh, per each massive amounts of data, but in aggregate they do, the, the latency is a very important aspect as well. No, I mean, this is the the pain. I'm going to go back to what I said of enterprise storage. <laughs> what has always crushed like traditional Cast enterprise that. storage, right? And it's, just it's, uh, it's, spend a minute or two talking about um, how you prepare, how you, how you think about responsible use of generative AI. So, you know, we've been talking about um, all these millions of tiny IO. And then there were two. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, we might be having a few technical problems here and bear with us if so, but I, I wanted to jump now to a, um, a question about how to make responsible use of generative AI. And especially when, when we think about the energy and climate implications of having all these GPUs um, using all this electricity, uh, doing the millions of tiny IO read writes. So what, what are the shortcomings of traditional data architectures when, when you try to think about preparing for those kinds of loads? Brilliant. Uh, Alan, do, do you want to start or should I? You can take it first. Brilliant. Uh, so uh, when you look at the, the 
sustainability challenges, the power challenges, and I think I teed it up before saying that we're seeing that as a growing concern. So uh, again, that survey that we, we, we did, and if we're looking at uh, multiple organization, um, worldwide, there's this notion that 3% of the world power is now feeding data center. Data centers, and obviously in different locations, um, there's that, that percentage even changes. There, there are some countries where the data center usage o o passes the population usage, right? So massive amount of power is already being used to, to, to power these uh, data centers, and a lot of them are these new GPU environments. Um, the estimate is that by 2025, 8% would be actually used to power these data centers. So there's massive um, sustainability and eco environments implication, obviously the heat, the power that, that it then generates. Um, and, but there's also massive value. So if you're looking at uh, a lot of these newer multi-billion parameters models, uh, some of them cost more than $100 million in power only. To, to, to train. So not talking about, about the infrastructure, but just about the, the, the raw dollar amount that it costs to feed that environment. We're seeing different uh, environments on the globe uh, being more or less susceptible to power cost, but that's definitely a growing concern. Uh, in the past, we used to talk about infrastructure mostly. Now we're seeing a lot of CIOs that are adding actually sustainability goals to the environment. Uh, simply because it's, it, it has a very large dollar amount. So, so then there's the challenge of how do you tackle it? Uh, we mentioned these different environments, but how do you tackle this? Uh, uh, how do you solve it? We, we have that massive uh, cost. How do we alleviate it? How do we optimize for it? Um, yeah. Alan, do you want to say a few things? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and and because definitely these are some of the areas that we're investing in uh, both internally and some of the things externally with some of the OEM partners, right? Because they're going to make up a big component of this to help us solve the challenge you just walked through. I think the first one, and this probably won't surprise you, I think you and I talked about it before, Shimon, like one of our biggest beliefs, and this is what we're doing with our own AI projects internally, right? Everybody asks me, hey, you're a Fortune 50. What are you guys doing with AI? Uh, and we think about it of like very small, fine-tuned models, Right. So instead of having these big, massive models like an open AI that may not that may be hard, right, to get extract business value out about it, think about very small, highly customized models. And I'll give you an example. Like we had one, uh, we have a digital human representative that some of you might have heard about called Clara. Uh, and we wanted to train all of our new hires, right, to be able to ha you know, approach customers and talk about different products. Wouldn't it be great instead of just a traditional module that a digital human was sitting there, they could interact with her and they could talk to her uh, and, and actually get those LLM responses. We trained her on specific modules. So it wasn't even training her overall. There was 10 modules in the training course and we trained a model for each one of those various courses. So it kept the model extremely small right? So that at inference, we could really make sure that we're reducing the energy footprint across it. And we're encouraging, uh, you know, all that same type of approach across the industry, because it's going to help us solve some of these problems while technology is catching up. Uh, I, I will say too, technology is moving pretty fast in the space. Uh, we're tracking over 196, yes, I said that, 196 different accelerators uh, in the marketplace. So we all know the the big names out there, right, with NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, et cetera. But there's lots of VC money pouring in here to solve some of these problems, right? Larger memory footprints in the GPU, because we know that's what really is the biggest constraint in many cases, especially at inference and, and large training models. Uh, that's going to be exciting. So there's, let's say, stay tuned. The industry is working hard to do that, and we're trying to figure out how do we take all of those components to continue to reduce that, right, and, and make sure that we're still maintaining our commitment, right, of our uh, net emissions across scopes one, two, and three by 2050. Right, right. And Just very, sorry, very quickly, uh, Shimon, can I ask you guys to talk about what your two companies are doing? So what are Weka and Dell working on together to solve some of these problems? Brilliant. Maybe uh, I'll start. So uh, when we actually partner, Dell and Weka partnered in the OEM space for actually a long while now, and we're uh, generating these AI blueprints. So, so if a customer is now um, tackling their AI environment and they need to start with the day one, day two, day three 
uh, AI project, uh, how, how did they do it in terms of what software frameworks? Uh, Alan mentioned it. Uh, what, what's the in networking? How the storage would look like? So would I have uh, multiple disaggregated environments? Would I consolidate on a single environment? By the way, in the hint, hint, that's also a big part of solving the sustainability part. Remove legacy environments that uh, are just there from your enterprise day and you're trying to use them for AI. So we're partnering to do this uh, complete AI solution where a customer can have a validated design, uh, compute, networking, storage environments in a, that is predictable. And obviously it's optimized to feed their GPUs and get their business outcome uh, in a fast way. And, and uh, I'll kind of double click on that too. Like one of the big challenges for many customers, right? Is like, hey, I've got an incredible software stack uh, how do I bring make that real within my data center, right? To actually go do something and train these models, uh, you know, uh, from an infrastructure perspective. And uh, we want to make sure that we've got kind of a tailored, trusted, validated, and supported design, right, to help our customers. And so we saw this coming challenge. Uh, we quickly, uh, you know, embraced Weka and and went to market with them uh, in what we call our OEM solutions program that Shimon was uh, kind of referring to. So again, think about it as like an appliance like model, right? Where here we go, ready to go with the preload that you don't have to worry about pulling it all together because uh, these environments can be a little esoteric, right? Just like we talked about uh, with things like Hadoop, we're just trying to simplify that experience, right? So that you can just get on with the job and go solve the the business use case you're trying to do and get some value out of AI. You're not spending time building a science project. Okay, Thank, fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, so it's time for the Q&A portion of the webinar. And we do have a bunch of great questions coming in from the audience. We've been collecting those and um, I've got them in front of me and we will continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour. And again, you can submit them into the questions module on the right side of the screen. So here's the first question, guys. Um, there was a recent HBR article by Tom Davenport who wrote that there are three primary approaches to incorporating proprietary content into a generative model. You can train an LLM from scratch. You can fine tune an existing LLM or you can prompt an existing LLM. And um, so I wonder if there are any other approaches and, and what would be the, the data management implications of each of those? Uh, Do you want to take it, it first, Simone? Yeah. yeah, sure. So, so different, uh, obviously, um, these are three examples. There is more, for example, ragging on, on the data is another one to make sure that it's up to date that your model, your already pre-trained model is up to date with new new data from your organizations. And, and there's a few more because even with that, within that, there's different categories. Uh, I would say that, uh, and, and actually not all approaches are suitable for all organizations. If I'm in the business of generating LLMs, uh, yes, I will train my new model completely. I will create a new model. I will create, I, I will train it on massive amounts of data. That's usually the most data intensive, most expensive fashion to actually do it. I would say that um, in the nascent stages of uh, AI, generative AI, we, we all said, wow, this is amazing. Let's create our own LLM for our own organization. And, and that also spoke about, uh, if I'm going back to the sustainability and power usage, that's the most expensive one in, in all of these aspects. So, so as AI organiz as, as actually as we mature, as organizations and we are able to, to fine tune more of our needs. As Alan mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll train my LLM, but maybe on a very specific part of the data. I don't now need to, to train on anything. So so obviously, the just going back to the question, training a complete LLM is, is the most massive amounts of data and compute environments, and obviously as a result of that of power. Fine tuning a model uh, it is relevant in many places. I, I gave the fruit uh, seller example or the vegetable seller example. Y yes, sometimes that's uh, the next day. So sometimes that's all you need. Uh, you, you transfer, learn your, your new layers into the uh, neural net, and now you can recognize new things. Um, models degrade over time. So even if I trained, I would even say that even if I trained a large LLM, uh, over time, I will need to constantly either retrain it or fine tuning it or fine tuning it to make sure that the accuracy of my model um, persists. Um, I've seen some studies that shows that actually fine tuning a generic model like a Llama V2, for example, 
is uh, in the long run, it's more accurate and cheaper than building an LLM. But again, different organizations would have their different needs. I would say that we're seeing more and more of ragging now um, to, to prevent this hallucination. And the implication of that are actually, um, I would say it's very focused. You, you, you now need to embed uh, your data into a database. You now need to make sure that your model can refer to it. You don't need to start train everything constantly. So maybe even back to that data management and prep side, right? Uh, that's a great example of like RAG being able to point to an existing knowledge base and start to take a pre-trained model and just get value out of it, I think is why everybody's picking that one up, right? Because I can spin and do that many times in hours or days, not weeks or months. <laughs> because I, and, and I think we're starting to see that like there definitely will be a subset of customers that will continue to train a foundational model, right? For the right use cases. But we see that a vast majority of enterprises are not going to do that. They're going to do fine tuning or customization to an existing model because there's lots of great models out there and, you know, that are available, especially in Hugging Face and other places. And then be able to, you know, do some fine tuning or customization or rag against uh, known data sets. So I, I, I think it's, it's, you know, various phases, but fine tuning, customization and rag, I think, are where things are trending for most well, companies. Can, as a sequel to that question, can you put any numbers to this? I mean, do you do you have a sense of how many biz businesses are training their own LLMs in house as opposed to using, you know, Microsoft or Google or IBM or some cloud product? If you look, uh, I, I can give you some because we did did some studies on this. Um, if you look at at actual, you know, cloud versus on prem from a foundational training, I mean, no surprise, based on some of the things that Shimon gave you, back to that balloon cost in the public cloud, a majority of them actually have been on prem. Uh, when I say on prem, keep in mind that means things like co load. <laughs> they didn't necessarily build out a data center; they co load and put them somewhere else. Um, but predominantly, if you look at the percentage, it's a good, it's a vast majority, about 75% uh, in the survey that we did, you know, we're on-prem. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to go back to the audience questions. Um, here's one. What can or should be done to manage the quality and consistency of data up front? Are there best practices for designing data collection processes uh, or for correcting bad data habits? So I would say that there's the notion of uh, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is avoiding data silos. So uh, we see organizations, again, continuing with their enterprise um, days where I had my, my database environment, I had my ERP environments, I had my uh, HR environment. So I have multiple environments that are disconnected. They're each accumulating their own data. Uh, th that data is disconnected. It's built in different formats. Um, now, when I need, if I do need to do an organizational activity and, and process, train, create something that would look at all of that data, now, now I need to uh, massively ETL or pre-process on that data. So first of all, avoid, what, and we're seeing that more and more, and, and there's more and more standards that are actually now being implemented where um, you, you now need to go to this uh, data uh, ocean, we, we call it actually, consolidate everything in, in a single environment that obviously can accommodate for that. But so there's the, the framework environment, there's the storage environment, but there's, there's the data and how it pours in itself. So consolidating on a, on a single environment, but also on a single uh, data pattern. And I'm saying single, it's never single, but decreasing the amount of different uh, uh, formats that you're using is, is a big help. I would say that also uh, as organizations are exiting the exploratory stage and they're moving into the what's my ROI on my investment, um, data scientists would also consolidate on the way that they're um, utilizing the data because if now I have two data scientists, as I mentioned, and there's five different ways to pre-process the data. I'll, I'll give an example. If I'm looking at an image, uh, one data scientist would, would like to say, yeah, I, I'd like that image as it is. One would say, hey, I want only randomized pixels. One, one would say, hey, change the contrast to this. One would say, I want only the five left pixels and the rightmost bottom. So there's different ways uh, that they're pre-processing. The more you consolidate on how their models will be created work, the less you need to pre-process the data. There's also the the notion of pre-processing inline versus pre-processing offline, which has different um, 
um, benefits, right? So I can preprocess inline, which means I don't need to save my preprocessed data, which can also be substantially heavy on my storage. But on the other hand, uh, then I need to preprocess inline, which can introduce latencies into my environment, uh, increase the compute, where I, if I just had it preprocessed already before my storage, I could just have read it. So not all approaches are applicable to anyone, but if, if I just summarize my last minute, uh, consolidate to a data ocean, eliminate the data silos uh, in terms of the framework, but also in terms of the um, formats. It's it's kind of what I alluded to earlier, right? Everybody kind of stopped because of like the challenges around a data lake and moving towards those technologies like Hadoop, right? Nobody brought structured and unstructured data sets in one place. And we know even those that, that started to, right? Uh, if they were successful and they had the skills, that was great, but that was the top pillar. Many of them dabbled in it and and just failed, right? Because ETL processes can be fragile, et cetera, and nobody wanted to you know, pay for a second copy of data and cost setting around that, right, from an yeah. enterprise perspective of how to manage that. That's you know more affordable than ever to exactly what you just said of like newer, modern approaches, you know, because we think about it in this context of, you know, in your AI journey, it's really kind of the three disciplines I've talked about, high performance data analytics, traditional AI and generative AI. We need to figure out the use cases you're trying to, to actually solve, right? And then apply the right calculus to that. And sometimes it might just be predictive analytics that people are trying to reach for. And there's lots of things, again, back to if I'm trying to do that, hey, I probably need to step back, exactly you said, pull it back into the ocean, Oh, and then by the way, put a high-speed query engine in front of it to be able to do uh, in-place, you know, queries uh, for predictive analytics, which then leads me to that next step for AI. If exactly said, and what we're doing internally, right, is there's lots of great tool sets out there to help prep data. Um, I'll just call one out because we're using it pretty extensively internally. Uh, Nvidia Rapids, right, to help us cleanse the data, right, using AI <laughs> to prep and cleanse the data. Because uh, nobody wants to spend time doing that. And I think having a standardized process, exactly what you called out there, Shimon, is the biggest problem I see with customers. Because data scientists can't agree on the methodology. You have to agree on a methodology that you can apply across all the use cases. Okay, great. Uh, I want to move on to, uh, we have a couple of questions coming in from small business owners or small business operators. And I want to kind of uh, post both of them and let you reply in turn. So. First one is um, big companies and large organizations may have the ability to build their own LLMs, uh, but what 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 about the millions of small business owners out there? What what can they do within the data management constraints you've been talking about to take advantage of this revolution? And then kind of a related question: How can they do that without risking data leaks and other and exposure to cyber threats, which you know no small organization can really afford uh, that kind of exposure? You want to jump in first, Shimon, or you want me to? No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll take second seat now. Yeah. So I, I, I think about it in different buckets. And and in fact, uh, you know, like we, we named, and this is what I think a lot of organizations are going to start to do, right, is thinking about from an AI first uh, perspective of naming a chief AI officer. And like our CIO is exactly trying to identify what you called out. Right. Like, how do we help our customer in the journey as the as the customer is growing from a small business to a large enterprise? And there's lots of things that we're doing of like, think about it, of even just embedded AI, because we kind of called that out earlier of things like Copilot. Hey, it's take advantage of that to get that productivity enhancement up front. Uh, where you might have heard about NPUs and other technologies that are coming even into PCs, for example, to help offload and run those LLMs and be more efficient on the front end side, right? And increase productivity. So it's an easy way to step in without building any of the infrastructure we just talked about. Um, then I think it's back to the piece of the most important. You do want to power this. You can get a lot of uh, advantage out of AI, but it's even more important for the small business to think about what I said of like, hey, I need to take an, a pre-trained model. <laughs> I'm going to do a little fine tuning and customization against it so that I can make sure that I have the smallest footprint required to build this out. Because they probably aren't going to be able to afford a GPU server or two uh, to get going. And then as they prove out those models and start to generate revenue or profit, that's going to enable them to fuel the next level of innovation and investment in AI. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in a bit. I, I think if... 
so everything that Alan said, plus I think that a lot of, uh, if you look at it, there's the mature, matureness of, of the organization. So m- much in the same way that traditional, for example, if I'm now starting a startup, I'll start lean and, and mean and fast, and I'll just use pre-trained model to prove my point up to a certain extent. Um, realistically speaking, at that spa- stage, w- when I'm just proving my value, uh, security is usually less of uh, the main focus. As, as the organization mature, suddenly maybe now I'm at the, instead of consuming AI models, I'll, I'll drop, dr- download different um, mod- pre-existing model, maybe from stability, maybe from hugging face. There, there's a few other vendors already out there and I'll, I'll start using them. Maybe I'll try to pre-train them, but honestly, I, I, I like to, to start fast and prove my value. Um, as the organization mature to small, medium already, now maybe I already need to implement a data strategy. I need to focus at all of my data sources and where do I get the data? Where does it reside? Who owns it? Who can access it? What are the regulations at the different localities? Is it worldwide? Um, the, the, and, and that's a bit scary for small organizations that don't want to spend their time and effort on on managing managing that. They're actually they they want to get to their business outcome to their customers to provide the value. Um, so the best advice that I would give is use and, and that's what we're seeing. Use, use advisors. There there are already a lot of organizations that are a lot of partners. Um, we work with uh, some of them, obviously, that are able to say, hey, we already implemented multiple AI projects. So not only in the infrastructure level, but um, these are the 10 things, 20 things that you want to consider when implementing and thinking about it. So instead of reinventing the wheel, which, large, by the way, larger organization can do and will do uh, because of the regulation. But if you're small to medium, just utilize one of these uh, partners that already did it in many environments and can actually take you through that journey. Great, great. Uh, uh, this is a fascinating question. What do you think will be the impact of late adoption of these technologies and the generative AI technologies and the data management practices that need to go with them? So you can imagine different markets um, and different regions of the world will be adopting uh, this technology at different rates. So. Um, will that really hurt in places like, I don't know, Latin America or Africa, where adoption may be a little bit behind schedule, or maybe there's a countervailing benefit that if you wait long enough, you kind of leapfrog past all the mistakes that everyone else made in the beginning. I think it really depends on the use case. So there, there are already some proven AI generative AI use cases that are not even exploratory. For example, if I'm now running a manufacturing line and I can run predictive environments to, to query my manufacturing line, all of my thousands of sensors and, and even predict my next failure rate and my own supply chain. These are, I wouldn't say easy, but these are semi-proved environments already. Obviously, over time, they will improve. So the, the implication of not adopting them now obviously means that I'm losing potential value because I will have more malfunctions. My supply chain wouldn't be as optimized as it could be. Uh, adopting it later would actually mean that when I will, they will be more optimized, but hey, I lost all of the running ground uh, around it. Uh, it really depends on also if you're in the business of training an LLM, fine tuning an LLM or consuming an LLM only. Um, yeah, I would say that that's the, the you, you, you want to make sure that you're looking at what you can already do today. And, and I, I, w- I would also reference another survey that we did actually a year ago where we looked at the multiple organizations in the same in the same verticals, uh, life science, uh, financials, media entertainment, and more. And, and we saw that each of them has more than one AI project. So I would say that there's all, always the, you should keep at the back of your head that if I'm not using AI currently, probably my competitors are. And... Um, God forbid they get a leg up on me. So you should. That, that's it. that's exactly where I was going to go, Shimon. Like, I think that's the biggest thing, right, is the digital disruption. I, I think we're at the early days of AI and everybody's feeling that, right? I, I'm still calling this is the breakout year for AI to really start getting some pretty significant inference use cases across every vertical. Um, but when I when I think about it, it is all about outflanking your competition. If you thought there's digital disruption in the dot-com era and look at what happened over the last 50 of the Fortune 2000 uh, switchover, right, to names that we never knew, to verbs that we just, you know, that are in our vernacular now and tools that we use in our day-to-day consumer life, 
that's going to happen. So yeah, it, un, you know your marketplace, right? You know who your competition is. You should be aware of what they're doing and leveraging with AI uh, because you do have an opportunity to be disrupted faster than ever if you don't take advantage of AI. So it should be on your, on your plan. That's why 92% of the organizations came back and said, yeah, we're taking an AI first. It's not even they're investing net new dollars. It's that they're going to take you know th dollars away from traditional IT and other areas to invest in AI now. And, right. and I, I would say one last word about it, actually. AI is not a binary. It's not, I'm doing AI, I'm not doing AI. AI is you build that muscle. So even if you build that muscle across implementing an AI project, learning what it takes in, in all technical aspects, uh, but business or organization aspects as well, you, you're building that muscle over time. So even doing it and failing and doing it and, and succeeding a bit, once you these environments mature more, you, you're in a much better place to, to succeed. While if you just start, let's say a year later, everything is more mature, but you don't have that muscle, then you'll be late to the game. Okay, uh, lightning round question. Answer this in the length of a tweet. That's 280 characters, right? Um, if you were on X. So um, the question is, how would you, is there one thing you'd recommend for people to help them keep up with AI and bridge any knowledge gaps around AI? Read everything every day. No, I'm joking, <laughs> uh, but read a lot. It, this, this is a fast growing field. It changes literally every day or two. Um, if, if, you, it's, if it's really an interesting uh, point for you, uh, you should keep up to it daily. Yeah, this, uh, I, I always say learn something new every day. So it's right in line with that. But I, I would say I'm going to summarize what we kind of talked about in the whole session. Maybe I'd say like the capabilities of AI models and deployment considerations uh, you know, that we talked about should be applied to the business use cases that can make a difference. It's not AI for AI's sakes, right? It's how do I actually achieve a business outcome leveraging AI? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for being so brief on that final question. So this has been a great discussion. We're out of time, unfortunately. I want to thank both of you gentlemen, Shimon Ben-David from Weka and Alan Klingerman from Dell. And I want to say thank you to our audience today for your attention and for all of your great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to ask all of them. So a final thank you to Weka for sponsoring today's webinar. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank